characters of the national one and are in the standard group. So, what do I say about that? Not you. Oh, superb. Yeah, it's Superb artist. Just look at that. <laughs> Pretty 
much looks like anybody's bird room. The things I've done on a corner, you know we have a dark corner and a slide awkward parts. So I put a ball, small triangular piece in, which cut the corner off. That gives you from front to back almost three foot deep. Yeah? In the corners, the birds would nest in the corners more than anything else. Um, I never used nest boxes on the front, you know, like the Australian features, so we can inspect. Because I was kind of breeding birds where you couldn't inspect the nest without them deserting anyway. So all the nests, if I put a nest box in, were facing along the cage. In the back where the birds would settle better. Um, you can see probably some of these. I had one small flight, which is all dead at the moment. This was after I'd done a breed so the plants didn't get watered. Um, you'll see through the video that it, it was dressed in different ways to suit different birds. Sometimes it was a tropical jungle, sometimes it was a dry desert for quail finches, what I did. Um, at the time, I think this was mainly new mini guinea mannequins, so they're quite sparse, just a few grass sods in, a simple box or basket in the corner, always facing so the birds can see you. And you did settle much better that way. Every nest I've ever had freestanding has always had it so the birds can see you. You know, we always put nest boxes facing away. Yeah. So I think the birds are telling you something here. Um, again, I dress the cages, just tiny details, whether it's for mannequins, just things to carry around. This is an important detail I'll come to later, a finger draw with egg food rather than on the floor. And the space between the perch and the egg food just transformed breeding mannequins completely. And it sounds silly, but it, it works. Um, I had a velix window in the roof for natural daylight. There's no doubt, whatever light you buy is never going to be as good as sunlight. This was a heating cupboard where I used to have live food with a hospital cage above. Uh, this was the small flight again. Again, this is a quail finch nest on the floor. They always nested next to the door. That's the same flight one as bamboo parrot finches. So again, it was dressed to suit parrot finches more than quail finches. And then breeding twin spots, there was a tropical jungle and a waterfall. Water was the secret again. Running water just transforms the birds. So again, I like plants, so I've got brown leaves and orchids and things, so half of it was just to look nice for me, but the birds appreciated. You could hide food around, made the birds work for live food. If you're feeding too much live food, you get deserted eggs, deserted nests, you get aggression. Yeah? So I would put little like um, film pots, you know, film containers that the birds have to struggle to get into and hide them around under the plants in different areas. And I like to green twin spots and I love that. Although now I don't feed any live food whatsoever. Rose and pinkies in the field. It stops half your, half your problems. Again, this is the waterfall. Now the first shot when all this was dead was a result of just on the top, this was a waterfall here, just on the top the first time the uh, uh, Western bluebills nested. It was actually on the waterfall itself. So it's actually the edge of the nest touching the water. Um, again, lightning, you studied the lightning at uh, nth degree at one time, and you see all this about the ultraviolet light and all that, the vitamin D3 and that. And it's basically a complete waste of time to spend a fortune on lightning for that. Um, again, the reptiles is where it's all the research was in. But if you get a, a reptile, they basically bask or lie on the light stick of the, the thing. Now, if you buy a UV tube, within the first three days, you've lost 20 to 30% of that UV coming out straight away. They fade off so quick. It just goes. You, you're wasting time. And if you have it in a bird room, unless they're within two or three inches of the light, they're not getting any benefit. So you spend a fortune, you stick it on the roof, and you're wasting your money. You can buy an Osram tube or a Phillips tube, six foot for six about six pounds. It's 98% the same as the sunlight. It'll last you six months a year. So that's all you need. And basically, the good lighting is basically for the, the bird's eyesight, I find. Yeah? Birds see different for us, it's more the UV rays. But it's like the same in humans. If you meet a girl and it's sexually attractive, they blush, they get red lips, all these things. You don't actually notice, but you do. Yeah? It's not obvious. I'm sure birds are the same, they evolve coloured beaks when they come into condition, the blue bills go pearly blue, you know, gullion finches, bills change. Now if you have bad light, how many different feather mutations and different things 
we don't notice, but the birds miss as well. So I think rather than UV, concentrate on sunlight, get the Kelvins right, so it's the plus the sunlight as possible. Yeah? And again, nothing compares to natural sunlight, so I always have solid walls, you put cages all the way around, when you're in the roof, and that's the best way for it. Yeah. For planting and screening, I find again, birds have four levels of cages. For the likes of wax bills, bottom cages were no good, top cages were no good, middle two were the best. You get away with Australian finches, top and bottom, sent more sensible birds. Any wax bill, if I put up a height, if it's out of sight, they just fall to the floor. They live on the floor, you have to get them a stool to see if they're still alive. You never saw them. They're always scary, always panicky. Um, so most birds, if you get certain pairs of birds and they were really crazy wild, once you've settled them in, you know they eat right, they've got the diet right, I just put them in a small cage, put them next to where I prepare the food. For two, three weeks, when you get used to it, you realise that you're not such a threat then. Then if you put them back in the cage, you are fine. Again, I learned the lesson of putting too much cover in. If there's too much cover, the birds hide away and they just stay wild. Put them in a bear cage and they'll calm down. And then you just need a nest box with some cover around the nest box. I never put enough cover in so the birds can't see you. It's, it's advising you to see the birds, but the birds like to see you as well. So what I've done is I've put plants on the outside. So you, you didn't make the cage smaller by filling plants inside the cages. The plants were on the outside. The advantage is you can wash them, you can take them outside for a hose pipe on. Plants where you can see through, there's a barrier, but they can see you, you can see them. Uh, that worked far better than anything else. <coughs> At times, you'll probably see later on the video, I even just got some large pieces of grass and just wove it through the, through the front of the cages, just to give it a bit more of a barrier for the birds. But as long as they can see you, they'll be quite calm. I think if you put a solid barrier at that unknown quantity, and they, they stay keeps, uh, kind of scary. Okay, <coughs> any questions about the bird rooms? You said um, about the distance between the perch and the finger draw. Right. Can you just elaborate on what you meant by that? That will come up in the next section. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So next, uh, if we go through, say, the mannequins. It was New Guinea mannequins. I had the, the thing. There was very little known about them at the time. I picked out ones up here and there. And I finally got a, a, a guy, Rodded's primary flight. I know if you know the guy. Yeah. And I've booked him for years to get some ma New Guinea mannequins, but one or two pairs was no good. I needed them in numbers. Yeah. And Rod came up trumps, he got them in huge numbers. <laughs> so we got all kinds of weird and wonderful things. Uh, these were white spotted mannequins, unlike any other mannequin ever. Um, they don't sit upright on a perch, they kind of they lie over a perch. The call was very much like a Pacino finch or like a zebra finch. Um, the actions, they were just so unmannequin like. I got three pair, I got a nest with five chicks up to about ten days and lost them, and then after that couldn't do a thing with them at all. You could sex them quite easy, the hens are like a starfinch, kind of like that out of focus look on the spots. Um, cocks under the, the vents were black, hens were brown, so that wasn't a problem. Cocks would sing, display, make nests, would never lay with you. When they came in through quarantine, the losses on the hens was terrific. They were so delicate. They had diarrhea. Nearly every bird we got had diarrhea. And I had some birds for probably two years. Had them in a, a six foot cage. And I pulled the slider out, moved them into the next cage, put the slider back. The next year, they were both just about dead and they died within two or three days. I've had a perfectly good bird I've caught up. Took for a 15 minute ride to give to somebody else. And it's died by the time you get there. And that's after being in captivity for two years. They were just so delicate. Um, these are great build mannequins. I don't know why they got that neat. <laughs> Which are about the size of a Java sparrow. Again, we didn't get enough numbers to, to be able to do anything with. Um, although there's a few people on the continent now having some good success with these. Uh, when they're in condition, fine, fine birds. So what I've done with everybody in the bird club and through this study forum, I thought, well, We've got to get as many of these birds into some kind of breeding scheme as possible. And I paid something like £820 a pair for Grand Valley mannequins and New Britons just picking out one up here and 
a year or so later, I found another odd one. So when you're out piles, you know, you can get them 30 pounds a pair. Or if you buy more, you, I could get them trade price less than that. So we'd have 20 pounds a pair. So I thought, how can we get people to buy more than one pair? Because if I see it, I can get your grandmother's for 30 pounds a pair. Everybody in the club, I'll have a pair, I'll have a pair. But if you get two cockroaches, you're wasting time, you need a few numbers. So I came up with the idea with Rod. I said, if I buy X amount of birds, how much? I gave him 20 a pair. So I just said, everybody in the club, I can get you pairs of mannequins for 30 pounds a pair. Buy two pair, and the club will give you a pair free. You were basically paying for them, because just by, if everybody had three pairs, you're going to get cocks and hens, you're going to get more numbers, I could get them for £20 a pair. So I get three pairs for £60, that's what the people paid for them. And it was just by telling them a fib, everybody had three pairs. So we set breeding schemes up, and we've done fantastic with them. Uh, Grey crowns, these were probably the easiest. And out of every mannequin, they all needed to be in separate pairs. On a colony system, they wouldn't work except for great crowns. They would not work as single pairs. For on a colony system, they went great. A um, delicate friend of mine who put, I think, four pairs into it. There was a spare bedroom. He just penned it off and let the birds go. Then he bred 35 within the first six months. Where are they now? You know, you go through this video and I look back like a wish list of everything you would want again. Yeah. And I bred these, studied them, videotaped them, and I gave them away. <laughs> <laughs> if only. So again, in most of the New Guinea mannequins, you could sex by one or two, which was kind of an absolute nightmare for me. <laughs> um, so good, different species, the, the grey crowns were great. Um, these one I concentrated on, I, I, I found a couple, I paid £120 for the first pair, turned out to be two cockpits. So when I got some of these, I had five pairs, and they were very nervous, very scary. So again, to settle them in, I put lots of colour in, get them to on a diet and everything. They would eat some egg food and they would eat hard seed. That was it. I had to put them in in bare cages first, get them calmed down and just steady them up. And then with the soak seed, I started putting some egg food in to try and get them on egg food. Wouldn't touch it. But then what I do is I work on instincts of birds. If you see a bird go to a beard, all the other ones come. Yeah. And if a bird catches an insect or something, or there's something to go over, they'll fight over it. So it's working on this instinct of birds to, for something they can't have, kind of thing. I found out if I put the egg food in this finger drawer, put it up next to the perch, and put an odd mealworm in, because they were taking on mealworm, they would go over and pick at that, so it gets them used to picking from a finger drawer. And then again, the egg food was starting to go. And then, again, that was too easy for them. So if you move the egg food about two inches away from the perch, the birds kind of get out easy. Now if you have a group of birds in and you put that egg food there, they've got to go and fly and hang on the wire to eat some egg food, or even if there's one mealworm. Now once something's on the wire, then that everybody wants to be at it. And they'll fight to get in that finger drop first. So within two or three days, they were all eating egg food. Absolutely crazy on it. And that was the secret. Once they were eating egg food, within a week, nests, chicks, I bred all five pairs from doing nothing. And it was just a sick finger drop. When the chicks come out of the nest, I put a D cup underneath the finger drop because the chicks are messy and they don't fall in. And it was just this kind of panic to get there first. And that worked with so many birds and I tried it with all the different mannequins and there uh, it worked with them all. It was so, so simple. Um, I think he's just feeding some chicks in here. Towards the end of this you'll see that the chicks coming out of the nest probably about five, six days old. And again they were eating the egg foods at that, that time straight away. And they were great birds. Again, I had five pairs. I moved house, I put them out on loan, and I got one cock bird back. You know, because people say, oh, I'll throw them in the air for you. And that was the end of that. So, uh, we kind of move on. Now, the other the mannequins I concentrated on, I had the uh, chestnut breast, sharpy eyes, little small ones, gorgeous things. Again, got one hen, so I managed to break from one hen. Could never get any more hens, so I gave those away at the end. And then uh, these are the young Grand Valley, uh, Grand Valleys. <coughs> um, you could sex the Grand Valleys quite easy. The cockbirds have broad bands down the side and colour in here, <coughs> where the hens are quite white and they've been broken down. And an adult hen, as they got to two or three years old, they'll get a solid black head. 
you know, like a back-headed gun, where the hens were still grabbing on the top. But the lovely birds, easy to breed once you've settled them down. And where are they all now? Yeah, um, where are they now? And when I bought the New Guinea mannequins, for 20 pounds a pair, I spent 1,500 pounds buying them for everybody. And I spent time, I videotaped and sexed as many pairs off as possible, and spread them around. Everybody was breeding them. Downfall was probably some of them were too easy. Yeah, it is. That's fancy, you know. Yeah. Shouldn't be bringing really something right here with you, but it is. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. you know, like when Derek bred 30 odd, you know. Yeah. What we're going to do with these? You know, you swap them for something else in the end. It's such a shame. So this is the thing you draw with the little teacup underneath. And you can see how the. You know, it's just working on that instinct of birds to, to go for things. They do copy each other. That was the thing where if it's in a, a dish on the bottom it's too easy to get at, mm. then you just ignore it. Yeah. And then there was the new Britain mannequins, which were the favourite ones of all. These are the small little chestnut breasts, about half the size of the Australian, little fine legs, yeah. and silver heads. You could sex them. Adult birds, the heads were slightly lower on the heads, but I spent hours. And with these divils, Put them in there, and I had quite a few, I had a group of about nine, I think it was, and I sat for hours and hours watching these birds. Nothing ever sang, nothing ever displayed, anything. And I set up a video camera, I put them in that small flight, and put a high perch, because the singing bird always goes up high, put the video camera off. And on the video, you can hear the door closing behind us, and there's five of them singing. <laughs> After months of watching them, all I had to do was leave the room. <laughs> That's the sharpie eyes, yeah. You see the use, this is the more food. Fantastic little birds. And again, I gave the last ones a week because I couldn't get them. And I'd spent years trying to get them. Years and years. I was so pleased. But, uh, but again, for sex and birds, video camera, your bird room is a different room when you're not in. It is, you'd be amazed at different sounds and things you've never heard before, for actions and that. And for, for sex and mannequins, I would just put the video camera, put a perch on a slight angle like that, the highest one, for half a dozen mannequins in, put the video camera looking up, and the mannequins are kind of sat, you know, kind of that angle, and if they sing, the heads come up, they will go split them so you put the tape on, you put the fast forward, you just fast forward, and you see a head come up, freeze it, flat, then you get sex dozens in a day, and just go through it like that. But look at this, this is the time you just left the room, and then, you see, you hear the door closing behind you, You rip mannequins were the favourite ones of all, and I picked odd ones up here and there. Oh, this is another thing. They were like locusts. You couldn't put a plant or anything in. It was like this constantly all day long. They would strip a room bare. So that's another reason to have your plants on the outside. So these are the new rips. Um, pity we haven't got the sound here, because one way of sexing these is through the call. Yep. Yeah. Can we hear this sound? Right. Now in a second, this, this is the only hen I ever got, cotton hen, and you'll hear the call. If you're part of them, or they were part for a while and you put them back together, it would call. And it's like high and low, dee da, dee da, dee da, yeah, cocks the high note, and you'll see it happen here. Yeah, so that's a different call. So birds at the opposite end of the room, you could tell which was up there. So when I first got New Britons, I got a group of about nine with Andy, Andy Machen. And I put them in a flight and I videotaped them. And they were chasing this one round all the time. And I thought I would lose it. It was obviously the cockroach just chasing the hen. No aggression. It was just constantly displaying and singing. So I caught them out and I said to Andrew, I said, well, that's definitely a pair. And I give them two more. And he ended up with two pairs and I ended up with all the cockroaches. <laughs> so looking through the videotape, after a while, if you notice on this pair, the cockbird's lily white breast and the hen's quite kind of like a yellow tinge to it, like a straw colour. And then on some of them, the cockbirds, the naked eye didn't show it up, but a videotape, I've noticed on some birds, videos shows up colours on birds that you don't see with a natural eye. And they had like white breasts, like a gilding. And I thought, ah, cockbirds are white there, and they've got white breasts. So Rod got a pile of new Britons in again, I went down and thought, I'm 18. I'm going for the yellowest ones I can get. Throw them all. So 
Go on, eight in back, you got one in. <laughs> yeah. Right, I've got to all the, the, the problems when I've got all the mannequins at first to section them. And with your ribbons, you look at the heads to look like a copper head. Size of the beak, level of the eye. Is the rump dark or light? Is it brightly coloured on the or is the, the vent area black or is it brown? And I marked up marked up all the things. And then I got some DNA sexed and it was completely wrong. <laughs> There's just no way you can sex them visually. Uh, and they're just absolutely fantastic little birds. Incredible. But again, people on the continent are breeding them now and there's some around and I, I know Delar Greaves has managed to get some and there's a few about. But definitely worth keeping it. Incredible birds. One of my favourites of all time. And again, once you get a pair, you can breed them quite easy. Um, single pairs in cages, in flights, they were no good. In groups, they were no good. Single pairs, and I used to use like a four foot cage as a small set would use, and that was fine. Yeah. Any questions on mannequins or anything? Are there any you can breed on colony? Uh, There's only the grey crowns. The they were the only ones. I even bred grey crowns. I've, I've tried separate pairs, about five different pairs in single cages for a year. Never bred a thing. And then I had five, which I thought were five young cockbirds, and I put in a, a three, foot, three foot or four foot cage. And then there'd been a hen in there, and we even bred in that small group. But single pairs would never do it. Spots, so we're getting kind of more difficult as we go along the line. So we're starting to kind of do Ouskies, Peters, my nemesis, the Greens, um, and then the Blue Bills and Seed Crackers. Okay. Yeah. So this is a rather multi looking Dubowski. Um, can be killing machines. Yeah. 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 Now, again, I found a way around it. Because, um, again, I only had. So I'm going to stop them. Now with the Dubowskis, again, you need some space. Uh, you need some cover, not too much cover. So if one or another, because the hens can kill cockbirds as well as cocks kill hens, mainly it's the aggression of the cockbird. And uh, it will be back in a sec. <coughs> so what I would do is, again, you'll see it on the video here, is if you just put two birds of birds together in a, a cage and the cockbird's in condition the hen isn't you're going to have problems you know you put so much cover in there the hen can hide to a certain point and then she's dead you know you get it at some stage and i found that the same with peter's twin spots a lot of the aggression wasn't directed at the hen it's kind of they just they've got that macho kind of thing and even with peter's twin spots i would find if you were a mixed collection they would fly and land very hard on a perch, chest up, like, I'm the boss, this is my territory. They wouldn't have tackled the birds, it was just like they show off and everything would clear out of the way. Now, if you just put the, the pair of birds in a single cage, he's only got the hen to go at. And he'll get more and more frustrated, the more aggressive he gets, the more she'll hide, and the more aggressive he gets, and it's 